live. Citizens of the Republic, welcome to the eighth Fetty Night Fight, brought to you by the Federalist Society's Student Division and the Federalist Society at George Mason University, Antonin Scalia Law School. My name is Sydney Dominguez, the president of Scalia Law's Federalist Society chapter, and I have the honor of introducing tonight's guests. Our speakers and moderators have traveled from the far edges of the galaxy to be with us tonight to debate the legitimacy of Senator Palpatine's plan for the first galactic empire. To moderate our event, we have sent a radio transmission to Grand Moth Ashley Baker, who is joining us via hologram from an undisclosed location in the outer room. Ms. Baker is the Director of Public Policy at the Committee for Justice. Her focus areas include the Supreme Court, regulatory policy, antitrust, and judicial nominations. Her writing has appeared in Fox News, USA Today, The Boston Globe, The Hill, Real Clear Politics, The American Spectator, and elsewhere. Ashley is also the founder of the recently formed Alliance on Antitrust Coalition. She has testified before the United States Senate on the topic of antitrust law. Ms. Baker is an active member of the Federalist Society, where she serves as a member of the Regulatory Transparency Projects, Antitrust and Consumer Protection, and Cyber and Privacy Working Groups. As a member of the Republican National Lawyers Association, she has served as a speaker on the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary. As an expert on the judicial nomination process, Ashley has worked closely on the efforts to confirm Justices Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh. Much of Ashley's work is at the intersection of the courts, regulation, and technology. Ashley also engages in policy analysis and outreach on legislation and regulations related to these issues by writing op-eds, letters to Congress for communication for committee hearings, and regulatory comments. Representing the Sith, we are joined by Darth Maul Adam Mossoff, who traveled here from Coruscant on his speeder bike. Darth Mossoff is a professor of law at Antonin Scalia Law School, George Mason University. He has published extensively on why patents, copyrights, and other intellectual property rights have been and should be legally secured to innovators and creators as property rights. His scholarship has been relied on by the United States Supreme Court, by lower federal courts, and by US federal agencies. He has been invited to testify numerous times for the United States Senate and the House of Representatives on intellectual property legislation. His writings on intellectual property policy have also appeared in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Forbes, Investors Business Daily, and in other media outlets. Professor Mostoff is a longstanding member of the Executive Committee of the Intellectual Property Practice Group of the Federalist Society, on which he served as chairperson from 2016 to 2018. He is also chair of the Intellectual Property Working Group of the Regulatory Transparency Project of the Federalist Society. He is a senior fellow and chair of the Forum for Intellectual Property at the Hudson Institute, a visiting intellectual property fellow at the Heritage Foundation, and a member of the board of directors of the Center for Intellectual Property Understanding. He is a member of the Intellectual Property Rights Policy Committee of ANSI, and he has served as chair and vice chair of the Intellectual Property Committee of the IEEE. USA, on which he remains a member in good standing. And lastly, from the rebel base on Alderaan, we have Jedi Master Obi Dan Sir. Master Sir serves as a senior attorney at the Liberty Justice Center, where he spends every day on the front lines of the fight to preserve our rights and liberties. He fights with blue state governors, the ACLU, and union bosses on behalf of people every day. In his cases, he's fighting for parental rights in education, especially school choice, and for free speech, even during a pandemic, and against cancel culture, illegal behavior by unions, and shut down schools. Prior to his job at LJC, Daniel was policy director for Governor Scott Walker in Wisconsin, and a law clerk for Judge Diane Sykes of the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. Master Sir holds a BA and JD from Marquette University, and a master's degree from Georgetown University Law Center and the University of Missouri Columbia. When he's not pursuing major constitutional cases in court, he can be found writing about them on op-ed pages like the Wall Street Journal, discussing them on Fox News, speaking about them at places like Yale Law School, or arguing about them with equally nerdy friends over beers. He is a member of Christ Church Mequon, an Eagle Scout and a fair weather runner. He's married to Anna and loves building Legos and watching Star Wars with his two young sons, Will and Graham. With that, we'll have Chewy ring the bell now to get started. Hello, hello, hello. 
And now I will hand it over to Grand Moff uh, Baker. May the force be with you. Yo. Yo, so I'd like to issue a few notes first. Um, and so prior to this panel, Master Sir and Darth Masov decided to play a game of Sabak to see who would argue which side. And since they were never, of course, told the odds, um, they are now in the position of arguing what would normally be the opposite positions of their respective guild commitments. Master Sir will argue for the legitimacy of the empire, arguing for peaceful acceptance of the government, and Darth Masaf will argue that Darth Sidious was not as wise as he may have seemed in creating the empire, because Sith are always conniving and looking to take over, of course. <laughs> so another quick note is um, for questions from the audience, um, you can drop them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and um, we will take them whenever we get to that segment of <coughs> panel. Um, and with that, Daniel, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. And let me start off with a simple question. Do you believe in the rule of law and democratic principles, or are you with the rebel scum? Tonight, I want to make four arguments in favor of the legitimacy of the empire. And I think we should start with this basic premise as conservatives. As a general matter, we should be highly cautious about claims that the rebellion is legitimate. For those of you who are religious conservatives, I think the starting point uh, for this principle is Romans 13, though it has to, uh, is hardly the only uh, biblical text talking about the importance of respect for the rule of law. Paul writes, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. The authority has been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so bring judgment upon themselves. For rulers hold no terror to those who do right, but only those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. Submit to the authorities, not only because of the possible punishment, but as a matter of conscience. Now let's remember when Paul is writing this. He is a Jew who is a Roman citizen who is often in a Roman jail being persecuted by the Romans on behalf of a savior who was crucified by the Romans. And yet Paul is telling us, submit to the governing authorities. If anybody has a justification for rebelling, it should be Paul. And yet his counsel to the Christians that he's writing to are obey the governing authorities. Here, I'm gonna throw up a slide to make my point. For those of you who are other brands of conservative, let's start with the original ideological conservative, Edmund Burke, who is most famous for a book entitled, wait for it, Reflections on the Revolution in France. And there he wrote, it is with infinite caution that any man ought to venture upon pulling down an edifice which has answered in any tolerable degree for ages the common purposes of society or for building it up again. We talk about being a Burkean conservative. What does that mean? It means to be the kind of person who respects the rule of law and the traditions of our ancestors. It's the democracy of the dead to use G.K. Chesterton's phrase. And so we should be skeptical when someone comes along like a revolutionary in France or a rebel alliance on Alderaan to say, let's throw it all out and start from scratch. Let's recall similar words from Abraham Lincoln in the Lyceum Address. Let every man remember that to violate the law is to trample on the blood of his father and to tear the character of his own and his children's liberty. Let reverence for the law, Lincoln says, be breathed by every American mother to the lisping babe that prattles on her lap. Abraham Lincoln, of course, spent the last years of his life fighting a rebellion. He reminded us in his first inaugural address, I hold in contemplation of universal law and the Constitution of the United States, that the union of these states is perpetual, 
Perpetuity is implied, if not expressed, in the fundamental law of all national governments. And I would say of all galactic governments, our baseline assumption should be respect for those in authority, respect for the rule of law and the governing institutions that have been handed down to us by our forebearers. So let me put it a little bit more simply. Darth Vader is basically the galactic equivalent of Ulysses S. Grant. And here you can appreciate the second Darth, the second coming of Darth Vader, Dick Cheney on the set of the Jay Leno show, embracing the moniker that was given him, uh, meant to be an insult by the left, but I think taken with both good humor and mild praise perhaps. So my first argument, as a general matter, we should be highly cautious about claims that it is the rebellion that is legitimate. Second, the empire is the result of democratic evolution. As we all remember from those terrible prequels, the empire was launched to thunderous applause after the attempted extrajudicial assassination of the Supreme Chancellor by the Jedi Council. Bail Organa and Senator Amidala are really just sore losers. They lost the vote on the Military Creation Act to create the clone army necessary to defeat the first set of rebels in the Star Wars universe, the Separatists, and then they became rebels themselves when they lost the vote ratifying the upgrade in the Chancellor's power. And I'll be curious to hear how Darth Mossoff defends the separatists as a rebellion that was legitimate? Or is it only certain rebellions that are legitimate in his eyes? And if so, on what criteria do you distinguish between the rebel alliance and their predecessors, the separatists? Back to my argument though, let's ask why was this upgrade in the chancellor's power necessary? Let's look at a similar story from the history of planet Earth. The Articles of Confederation that started this country were first written in November 1777. They created a Congress that gave every state one single vote and a weak president. In other words, it was much like the Galactic Senate with Chancellor Valorum in charge. It didn't work in America, which is one of the reasons that in 1787, the founders of this country reframed us around a new constitution with a strong, single, national executive to lead us through challenging times. The emperor is basically the unitary executive, acting in concert with the Senate, i.e. at the height of his powers under Justice Jackson's Youngstown test, in a time of war and crisis, which is the maximum point of his appropriate power to preserve the rule of law across the galaxy. Now, admittedly, later we learn from Grand Moff Tarkin that the Imperial Senate has been dissolved and that regional governors will now have direct responsibility for the systems in their sector. Hello, federalism. This sounds to me like John Paul II approving of subsidiarity, right? which is nothing more than the principle of both Catholic social teaching and common sense that problems should be solved closest to the people. Argument number three, the empire is the guardian of law and order. Stormtroopers are the thin white line that holds back the chaos of the galaxy and ensures that regular everyday citizens across the empire can pursue their businesses, live into free enterprise and capitalism, which are hallmarks of imperial rule within the context of an appropriately regulatory market. And I wanna note that it's the rebellion that is undermining the appropriately regulatory free enterprise system by working with smugglers. And in particular, it is the rebellion 
that is undermining the war on hallucinogenic spices that are ruining the lives of teenagers across the galaxy. I think if we look at the rise of the First Order in the third trilogy, we see the galaxy needs stability. In order to enjoy freedom, people need the rule of law. That's what the empire provides. And what the Rebel Alliance created was chaos. And when the New Republic tried to run the show, they failed, which is why the First Order had to rise again. Let me end with my fourth and final argument. I think we can't finish the case for the empire without also looking at one of the largest fundamental flaws in the predecessor Old Republic. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is that Jedi are judicial activists. They are unelected, they are unaccountable, they are super beings in robes who hold office for life. Let's not forget that it was Mace Windu, who's basically the Jedi equivalent of the Chief Justice, who led the thankfully failed attempt at an extrajudicial assassination of the Supreme Chancellor. But honestly, it's typical of the Jedi to render decisions based on their own so-called wisdom and values, which they draw down from the ether of the galaxy without being anchored to any text that might limit their power. In fact, they burn the tree that has the so-called sacred texts that they never reference because the texts might contain their power and they want unlimited power. I'll draw your attention here to Federalist 78 where Alexander Hamilton says the judiciary has no power over the sword or the purse and may be truly said to have neither force nor will. Well, the Jedi have swords, they're called lightsabers and they have enough credits to rent the fastest ship in the galaxy. And they definitely have the force. Like I said, judicial activists. Consider which Jedi master was explaining midi-chlorians and the force to a young Padawan this way, quote, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and the mystery of life. Was it Kaigon Jin? Was it Kanan Jarrus? No, it was Anthony Kennedy. I rest my case. Thank you. And I'll hand the floor to Darth Maul Mossoff for um, a hard act to follow there. <laughs> Thank you, Grand Moff Baker. And I, I have to uh, commend Master uh, Sir for those uh, excellent opening remarks. I met him uh, almost 20 years ago when he was, nay, just a small Padawan. And uh, he is long since no longer uh, been the learner that has since become a master. <clears throat> Although I will confirm his claim that the Jedi want unlimited power, his use and in invocation of PowerPoint itself proves this because as Darth Acton taught us so well, if power corrupts, PowerPoint corrupts, absolutely. And that is ex exactly what he has shown himself to be. Now, in my opening remarks tonight, I shall briefly set forth some of the foundational issues for Master Sir and me to have a robust discussion without having to draw our lightsabers between ourselves and the audience. <clears throat> we shall begin with the obvious point. The Galactic Senate certainly gave Chancellor Palpatine tremendous wartime powers, such that he was able to single-handedly announce the creation of the First Galactic Empire which of course included executing Order 66, resulting in the mass killing of Jedi, including the killing of even younglings. And yet the transfer of the power to now Emperor Palpatine was legal. 
It was approved by a formal vote and legal process in the Galactic Senate and the now discarded Republic. And that entire uh, process raised the fun raises the fundamental question in political theory and in real life, what makes political authority legitimate? And this is an important question because governments, terrestrial or galactic, wield coercive force. If you let the hate flow through you and you commit a crime, a government will take your money, your property, or even your life. And even if you listen to Master Yoda and choose a path of peace instead, in a private dispute, the government can coercively compel you to pay someone else, say for breaching your contract by dumping your cargo at the first sign of an Imperial cruiser. Or it can, it can issue an injunction to stop you from running your smuggling business at, at, at anyway by putting you in frozen carbonite perhaps. Or it could stop you from using your land speed or other property, even preventing you from selling it to the dirty Jawas. What justifies this coercive force? Now, John Locke, the towering intellect that he was, recognized that it is the protection of our pre-existing rights of life, liberty, and property that fundamentally justifies the government's use of its coercive force. But you need more than just the substantive moral principle. You also need a formal principle, the rule of law, something that the founders recognized very well when they sought to create a system governed by the rule of law, not of men. Now, these two principles, the substance and the process, individual rights and the rule of law combine to create stable political and legal institutions. They create the necessary conditions for private decisions to occur and to grow. Free markets develop and prosper, so with no longer a need for criminal syndicates run by the huts. In sum, you have, you have a flourishing society in which people are free in their rights to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, as lawyers, we often focus on procedure more than substance, and so we tend to over-prioritize formal proceedings and rules. We live and breathe the stuff of the rule of law. And so it's easy for us at times to forget the underlying substantive requirements that breathe life into these procedural rules that are barren without their animating source, individual rights. In political theory, it is individual rights that are the force that ties everything together and makes socio-political life possible. Otherwise, legal rules become divorced from their underlying justification. To turn a phrase from Justice Scalia, we shift from the rule of law to the law of rules. Anything goes, as long as there's a rule that allows it, including letting the Wookiee win. This is important to remember. The patina of the rule of law is what gives statist and authoritarian regimes their claim to legitimacy. We should never forget that there were elections in the Soviet Union and the Nazis themselves were very effective at doing everything according to proper procedural rules in their administrative agencies and in their courts. In fact, it's one of the reasons why we know so much about what they did, because they were so obsessive compulsive being Germans about being precisely bureaucratic about everything, including in the processes in which they implemented the final solution. But a naked grab for power, an illegitimate claim to political authority to perpetuate despotism, cannot be made legitimate simply because the right forms were filled out in triplicate and filed with the proper commissars and the proper agencies. If Mandalore can be crushed, the planet desolated and its people driven to the far reaches of space. If the emperor can disband the Senate with a wave of his hand. If Darth Vader and his inquisitors can prowl the galaxy, killing anything at whim, which mind you, I'm forced to confess that that would probably still not count as arbitrary and capricious under the, under the American Procedures Act. If there is no protection against unlawful detainer of a princess, even if she is a rebel and a traitor, then this is an authoritarian regime, a tyranny that is illegitimate and has no claim to the obedience of its people. It does not matter if at the time of its creation, it was legal because it crossed every legal T and dotted every legal I. To turn a phrase from the founders, quote, an emperor and his minions like Darth Vader, whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant, is unfit to be the ruler of a free people, end quote. 
Now, with that said, the founders were right in the document that I'm quoting from, the Declaration of Independence, that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient reasons. This is why I believe that Burke and others rightly rebelled against the French rebellion itself. By the way, it also helps us to remember what exactly the founders' beef was with England. There was a small tax on our tea. There was some quartering of troops and a disbanding of some colonial governments. And there was a massacre in Boston. By the way, a massacre in which five people died and six people were wounded. Insignificant compared to what was done under Order 66 and the other types of tyrannies achieved by authoritarian regimes in the 20th century. And yet for these, what we would now consider to be minor infractions, King George was declared a tyrant and the American colonists rebelled. And for good reason. So what are the key re issues to look for in considering whether a government has crossed the line from legitimate to illegitimate or was always illegitimate as with the empire? Well, first, you look for the loss of the rule of law itself, the arbitrary and capricious disregard even for the formal rules and processes that make possible peaceful and ordered government. Is the, are the minions of the government going forth, killing wantonly, destroying property wantonly, as, as every time Darth Vader left his Baca tank and went out into the universe without regard for any rules whatsoever, you have, a, you, you have an indicator that you no longer even have a, leg, uh, a legitimate, you no longer have a legitimate government and rebellion is appropriate. Consistent with this, you look at the wanton destruction of life and property. As I mentioned, it's basically what happened every time Darth Vader went out into the universe. And then third and last, censorship. Free speech is key, which is why all authoritarian regimes have always sought to stifle it. It's why China drove tanks over untold thousands of protesters in 1989, and why people are punished today if they dare to publicly question or criticize the, communist, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, as Jack Ma discovered this past fall when he, the multi-billionaire founder of Alibaba, to criticize the Chinese government in a speech at a conference and promptly disappeared for the next five months. Now, it's never mentioned explicitly in Star Wars, but it's clear that public criticism of the empire gets one in trouble. Absolutely. Now, by all three of these factors, thus, the Galactic Empire was and is illegitimate. Now, with the support of this opening statement, Grand Moth Baker, I now yield the virtual Zoom floor to Master Sir who will obviously continue to use his Jedi mind tricks in furthering his case. Thank you. And um, shall we call him Adobe one, Kenobi, with the, um, <laughs> with the PDFs there? Um, okay, Obi, sir, um, it's your turn for rebuttal. Excellent, thank you. So I will make three very quick points. Uh, as to the legitimacy of the empire, I think you need to um, look at, first of all, the perspective of your average everyday citizen. If you were a person just living your life on Tatooine or Dagobah, the empire really let you go about your business. It provided you with a stable currency of credits. It provided you with a relatively free and open trading system. It provided you with uh, a stable government. It protected the environment. If you happen to live on Dagobah or some other extremely green planet, uh, it was re really only when you crossed the line into active rebellion against the empire that the empire got up in your business. Uh, second, let me say that uh, Mr. Mossoff, Darth Mossoff had, I think three points uh, that he, he considered marks of a legitimate government. Free speech, the presence of wanton destruction, and where I'll spend most of my time, uh, appropriate protections and procedures for rights. I would say anybody who has seen a uh, video of Coruscant would recognize robust free speech by citizens of the empire. In fact, anybody who goes through... Uh, the ground levels of Coruscant, as Obi-Wan and Anakin Skywalker do at the start of the second movie, uh, with those hideous um, 
advertising panels, uh, I would say that the empire provides greater protection for commercial free speech than the United States government does uh, with its wimpy test for commercial free speech. Uh, second, you know, Darth Mossoff attacked the empire as wanton destruction. Uh, and certainly there are instances where war gets ugly, uh, but I would just raise up Cassian Andor, who started life, by the way, as a child soldier accepted into the rebellion. And ask yourself, as that man is shooting people on his own side, if the rebellion really believes in life and is opposed to wanton destruction. Uh, the most important point that I want to reflect on in this final minute here, though, is to talk about uh, the importance of procedure, uh, but also the reasons that we don't recognize uh, procedure in the exigencies of war. So it is true. Stormtroopers and Darth Vader engaged in the unlawful detainer of rebels and even the unlawful, I shouldn't say unlawful, the extrajudicial killing of rebels. And my question is, do you think that Bumedian and Rasul and Hamdi and Hamdan were rightly decided? In other words, are you with Stevens and Kennedy and Ginsburg in saying that President Bush did the wrong things in keeping America safe in the war on terror? Or are you with Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Scalia and the other dissenters in those cases who recognized that in the circumstances of war, even citizens of one's own country can forfeit that citizenship and the protections that come with it. I personally am with Justice Scalia on this. Thank you. Darth, your response. Master Sir has raised certainly some excellent points. Um, and I would also like to point out that this uh, debate confirms that Master Sure ha has in fact shot first. So, and let it be known that the Jedi are not defenders of peace in this respect. So I would emphasize that in response to his, his opening comments and in response to his, his, his uh, rebuttal that well, one should be skeptical of, of things like the French Revolution, which was a revolution unhinged from the protection of true individual rights. It was not a Lockean revolution. It was Rousseauian. It was a collectivist revolution. It's what you get when you have collectivist revolutions, whether they occur in France in the, in seven, in, in the 1780s and 1790s, or whether it occurs in Germany or in the Soviet Union or in Russia, in the 20th century, or in Cambodia, or in China. <clears throat> and it is in fact not true that collectivist governments and authoritarian regimes actually bring peace for the average person. If we recall from the actual the rise of the empire in Star Wars, it was because of a war precipitated by who? By Darth Sidious, AKA soon to be Emperor Palpatine is manipulating all of the sides, just as they often do, in order to create conflict as a justification for then appealing to people that they will bring peace and order to the galaxy and end the senseless conflict. That is always what totalitarians offer to people, is always is their balm for, under, for, for first, the crushing of their, what they might think are insignificant liberties, like rights of free speech, and some rights of liberty to move. And then ultimately they find themselves arbitrarily being thrown into the gulag or killed as people were repeatedly during Stalin's regime in the 20th century and even in, in, in under the Nazi regime and in China under Mao. And so it is repeatedly the case that while authoritarian regimes claim to bring peace and stability for average people, and that it is in fact just the byproducts of war that are the causes of the problems. It is often the case, if not always the case, that authoritarian regimes are the causes of the war 
and are the rationalizations for the, for the authoritarian regimes to continue to bring wanton destruction upon their people. Thank you um, for that response. And uh, before we get started with some audience questions, I have one question to start off the discussion, one that I kind of have a personal interest in, which is, did the empire sacrifice any possible claim to legitimacy the moment the first Death Star eliminated Alderaan? No. <laughs> so... Uh, I will defend the empire for a moment on this point. Let's start with the fact that Alderaan was a monarchy that had a hereditary princess that everybody was deferring to and was a nepotism style monarchy at that where the daughter of the ruling family was the one appointed to represent the planet in the Galactic Senate. Uh, so for all of the uh, uh, elegies to the separation of powers that have been offered up tonight, let us start with the fact that Alderaan was a monarchy. Let us continue with the fact that its monarchical ruling family are a bunch of liars who assert that this is a peaceful planet. And yet when they are arrested for fleeing law enforcement, we discover that they have a well-armed blockade runner, a blockade runner, let's just think about that as the name for the type of ship that they're on, tells you something about their intentions. When legitimate law enforcement officials enter the vessel, they are fired upon by a well-armed crew from the moment that they arrive, and lo and behold, we learn in the end that they were guilty of the crime for which they were committed, for, uh, of committing the crime for which they were being investigated. Um, slightly more seriously, I think you have to think about how you feel about President Truman's use of nuclear weapons at the end of World War II to answer this question. Because invading Alderaan to put down the rebellion that was obviously taking place would have cost the lives of tens of thousands of our sons wearing the white armor. And it was only the use of the Death Star, which I would analogize to the use of a nuclear weapon at the end of World War II. And so if you think that Truman was wrong, I respect that. But if you think that Truman was right in saving all those GIs from invading the Japanese islands, and if you don't know which way you think, I would suggest to you, Father Wilson, uh, Miss Gamble of Notre Dame has a book entitled The Most Controversial Decision, uh, where he goes through the sort of moral and political and military analysis of whether or not uh, deploying the nukes was the right choice uh, by Truman. And Father, Father Miss Gamble uh, concludes yes, I think tentatively, which is the right conclusion. It's not an obvious or easy conclusion. Um, but if you can be okay with that, I think you can be okay with what happened to Alderaan. Oh, you use quite an extreme analogy there. I was just going to call it a bad- I was accused of being <laughs> with the Nazis earlier, so I'll defend it. Well, I, I was just going to call it a bit of intergalactic imminent domain. Um, <laughs> inclusion. Um, so, Darth Maul, what, how do you feel about this? So, <clears throat> Uh, I think I think Master Sir makes many uh, 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 excellent points about the fact that there were many lies advanced by the rebels and as, and especially by Princess Leia about the peaceful nature of Alderaan that it was actually providing uh, material and other support for the rebellion um, and you know and any so in, in for all intents and purposes. I mean, if you think of you know, the places in Frankfurt and others that the Allies bombed solely because they were had they were manufactured areas of manufacture for this providing resources for uh, the Nazi war machine, um, then um, 
then those are those were valid military targets and Alderaan could also be a valid military target. Do you think that, um, you know, uh, Master Sir's comparison to nuclear weapons, I think, is a is uh, a good comparison in terms of, you know, the, you know, the, the, the closest thing that that represents. I would, uh, you know, although I do think it might be a little closer to the edge of whether it's legitimate or not, if only because blowing up an entire planet with billions and billions of people on it does sort of fall within the scope of non-proportional responses that the laws of war that have been handed down and have governed international conflicts since, since Hugo Grotius, you know, started to develop them in the 17th century. In fact, the founder of natural rights theory itself, um, you know, it's, uh, developed this notion of you know proportionality in the fighting of war. Now, um, I um, I don't necessarily agree that every action in war should be necessarily proportional. I do think you need to crush your your opponents if you are in an active uh, military conflict. And Alderaan was legitimate a legitimate military target given its support of the rebellion. Um, in fact, uh, as uh, I had a um, uh, as many know, I am a uh, as, as a Star Wars fan, uh, and uh, I I once had a, uh, a a student give me a, a gift after uh, after class. Uh, the semester was over once. It's a sticker. Is the um, it's the symbol of the Empire, and it says the Empire did nothing wrong. And I I so I stuck that on my uh, on my office door. And one day I came to work, and someone had put a post-it note underneath it that said, "What about Alderaan?" Uh, and so I, I added a post-it note under that saying, uh, with a citation to a Washington Post article from about six years ago that actually details all of the terms and conditions I think that, that, that Master Sir has identified as to why Alderaan actually was a legitimate military target and was not this kind of peaceful, you know, neutral planet that Princess Leia proclaimed it to be in, in, this, in, in Star Wars. Apologies for the unauthorized droid strikes. Um, so we, I need to take some questions from our audience here. First, we have Kevin Beck, who's asking, um, obi Dan Sir accused Mace Windu of wanting ultimate power. But as I recall, his beloved Chancellor Palpatine uttered these words. He did not so right after claiming to be the Senate. How is this not an improper violation of the separation of powers? I'm pretty sure Chuck Schumer has claimed to be the Senate at some point or another. Uh, I'll defer to you on that, Ashley, as we're <laughs> living in this world now. Um, look, I think we need to, to recognize the fact that neither the old republic uh, nor the empire lived up to our uh, federalist ideal of the separation of powers. Um, so in the old republic, there was no executive branch to speak of, which was why there was so much dysfunction. And anybody who sees Chancellor Valorum does not look and say, that guy should lead the galaxy. Um, I don't think anybody looks at him and says, yeah, out of all of the trillions, quadrillions of beings in the universe, I, I want that guy in charge, right? It's a symbol of the dysfunction of uh, the Senate, which by the way, to everybody who thinks that we need to like blow up the US House of Representatives to have hundreds more members, just like double the size of the U.S. House of Representatives. Just look at that Senate chamber in Star Wars and tell me that it's a good idea governing by applause lines. Um, there was no civilian control of the military in the old Republic. You had the Jedi who were not in any way officially chartered or responsible uh, in charge of the clone army. Uh, and prior to that, acting entirely independent of, of any sort of civilian control. There was this sort of loose consultation, I think, at best. Um, and the courts were dysfunctional. We know early on that Amidala goes to Palpatine when he's just the senator from Naboo and is like, hey, the separatists are invading my planet, blockading my planet. And he's like, oh, the courts of justice, they would take too long. So you might not like the empire. But the old republic was not doing it on the separation of powers either. Well, I want to take issue with some of the 
uh, points that Master Sir has made, although uh, made very eloquently, continuing to use his Jedi mind tricks. You can almost see his hand going, <laughs> pay no attention to the, to the weak points in the, in the, that I'm making. But, the, but, the, but I would like to uh, remind everyone of Churchill's very famous statement, right? That democracy is the worst form of government, except that it's better than all the alternatives. And that uh, clearly, yes, that the Galactic Republic did not have the, for, the beautiful system of separation of powers and checks and balances that the founders had created. In fact, it was much more like a parliamentarian system than it was uh, a, a system that we had, even though they had something they called a Senate, um, you know, that the, their executive was chosen from, the from, from, their, from their legislative body, as you would have a prime minister selected from a parliament. Um, and so it had all of the defects of our parliamentarian system. Um, and it, you know, it was, it, 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 you had excessive, uh, you know, majoritarianism and, 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 and demagoguery as evidenced by the rise of Palpatine, um, and, and that demagogues and, uh, and, and power lusters can take advantage of that as they always have. Um, I would highlight also that the things that, uh, Master Sir is, is, is mentioning, like when, uh, Senator, then Senator Palpatine says, oh, the courts will take too long. Well, that was all of his doing <laughs> as, uh, <laughs> as Mace Windu actually reminded uh, 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 young, soon to be uh, Sith Lord, <laughs> young uh, Anakin, soon to be Sith Lord Darth Vader um, in one of the most unconvincing uh, climaxes ever in movie history. <laughs> uh, you know, he controls the courts. So by the time of the, uh, you know, at that point in, in, this, in the story that, you know, that uh, it was Palpatine, Darth Sidious, who had so destroyed the government from within that it was, that it was, it was infected and rotted because of him. And therefore he was able to say, I will bring the, the solution. I will form the empire. Again, it's like, it's like authoritarian regimes or dictatorships causing wars, causing internal conflicts. Um, and then saying, I will end the conflict, I, so, so I will bring peace and order. So join me and support me. Well, as I think Churchill also said, um, those who can win a war well can rarely make good peace. I think that's close. <laughs> um, so next question is to um, Avi Dan, and this is from um, John Madigan, is revolution ever legitimate? Who decides it is legitimate? Was not Palpatine the original revolutionary by overthrowing the Republic and instituting the empire? Yeah, that's a great question, John. And honestly, there is not an easy answer. If you take away anything uh, from tonight, uh, I think it's that there is not an easy answer to when uh, revolution is legitimate. So on the one hand, we've got someone like Thomas Jefferson, right? Who says the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Um, so I think Jefferson seemed much more uh, open to uh, a regular revolution. Um, certainly Tom Paine, Thomas Paine was another uh, prominent figure in, in the founding era, was very comfortable uh, with revolution to the point that he goes over to France and, and supports the French Revolution. And there are a number of other framers who say, whoa, like the French king, he was on our side in our revolution just now. Uh, so this question of when a revolution is legitimate is a complicated one. I don't think there's an obvious or easy answer. Um, I believe what I said at the beginning, which is that we should be cautious about validating rebellions, that our starting point should be to assume uh, the good faith of the government and the rule of law. Um, but actually for myself, I agree with Darth Maul on a sort of a classic Thomas Aquinas uh, approach to when government loses its legitimacy, uh, a sort of natural law answer to that question. Um, and it's, uh, it's something that ultimately I think people have to figure out in their own souls uh, as to when the government crosses that line um, and then to act accordingly because the things that we're talking about are not just intellectual, they're important and they matter in the real lives of real people today in places like Syria um, and other parts of the world that are, are grappling with this very question. Uh, maybe the only other quick thing I'll say there is, uh, it, it's fascinating to think about this in the American context. If you wanna go back in history a little bit, uh, Richard John Newhouse, uh, who's a great Catholic writer, 
back in the early 1990s had a series of debates about whether the American government, uh, primarily because of its um, acceptance of abortion, had reached the point where it had sacrificed its democratic legitimacy. Uh, there's a book of essays called The End of Democracy uh, that confronts that question. And um, there were a lot of people who were very smart people who debated that question at that point. Uh, but it just makes you realize that this is a question that's with us still, whether it's uh, intellectual at a, at a time like tonight, or whether it's people in places like Syria who are dealing with it in their own lives. So on to a um, less controversial question from yeah. John Shu. We have, please compare and discuss the administrative seat of the empire versus the old republic. May <laughs> the fourth be with you. So do we need all those stormtroopers, really? Yes. <laughs> if anything, uh, we need more stormtroopers because uh, defending our border with the outer rim and keeping the Chiss ascendancy and the rest of those people on their side of uh, outer unknown regions and making sure that we in the empire have a wall that is guarded by stormtroopers and in star destroyers is, I would say, essential. Um, to the actual question, I, I think it's a, a, an interesting uh, question what, where sovereignty resides in the Star Wars universe. In other words, was the Old Republic, and to a lesser extent the Empire, uh, a supraplanetary alliance like NATO or the United Nations, um, or was it the sovereign itself? Um, and I actually tend to think the right answer this is less of a debate and more just being honest. I think the, the right answer is probably that the old Republic is more like the United Nations and that sovereignty resided at the planetary or sector level. And that when the empire came along, um, sovereignty was consolidated at the galactic level. And that's one of the reasons why the Imperial uh, military was so much bigger than the old Republic military was the old Republic didn't have sovereignty. So you essentially had Jedi acting like UN peacekeepers and just like UN peacekeepers are not very good at their job uh, because it's a big planet and they don't have any authority beyond their moral authority, uh, Jedi couldn't keep up with a big galaxy either. Well, well, Jedi have something that UN peacekeepers don't have, which are lightsabers. <laughs> <laughs> also, they can travel at the speed of light. <laughs> Okay, we have um, time for one or so more here. Um, this one is from Aaron Evans to Darth Mossoff. Did not the empire in the practice of allowing the taking of infants to be lifelong um, indentured servants of the Jedi? Great question. What is with that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, well, I mean, the Jedi is like a religious order. I mean, people are brought into it at a very young age and, and are, um, although, um, as we now know from uh, from the, the 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 Clone Wars series and the, on the ongoing evolution, that people could leave the Jedi. So Sokotan and leaves the Jedi Order. Um, so you were not forced to be there. They did not keep you there by coercion. Um, and um, and also uh, one has to re remember that yes, I mean the Jedi, you know, went out and found you know force sensitive people and brought them to the Jedi Temple in Coruscant, but. Darth Vader and his inquisitors are going around the galaxy and are killing force sensitive children <laughs> because the whole point is to continue to keep the Je Jedi from rising again. <laughs> so, so, it, uh, uh, you know, you're, 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 which is the worst one, right? You know, becoming, <laughs> being made, the, having an opportunity of becoming a Jedi and leaving that order if you decide that you don't want to be part of it or, <laughs> or being slaughtered by Darth Vader uh, for no crime other than the fact that you're more force sensitive than someone else uh, uh, would be them uh, than someone else in the universe is. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, it, you know, and but th and this is a common also point made or argument made on uh, behalf of some uh, uh, of sometimes of authoritarian regimes. I was once uh, you know asked a very serious question about well, you know, how can you criticize the Nazi government because 
they built roads and provided child protect, you know, child support services and a welfare system for people and everything like that. And this is like, uh, yeah, they they did do that. Yes, they built the autobahn and uh, and all these things. But you know, that's not the essence of what that government represents. And the government, you have to evaluate a government according to its essential principle. And I think the founding is a fundamental essential principle of how we should evaluate governments is to the extent to which it respects the it respects individual rights. Um, and and effectuates that respect through a system of rule of law through stable political and legal institutions, um, and and that that is kind of the the fundamental, and that's I think the reason why that you know the founders who actually ended up having the biggest influence in creating the government that we now have weren't. Thomas Jefferson, who actually was the revolutionary founding father, I um, mean, and continued to be caught up in the revolution of, in, of France uh, when 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 the French Revolution took off. It ended up being people more like James Madison, our uh, uh, the beloved James Madison of the Federalist Society, as well as pe- as well as people like George Washington, um, and later people like Abraham Lincoln and others who continued uh, this recognition of the importance of of having an insti- having institutions structured and governed around fundamentally the protection of individual rights while recognizing the practical necessities of, of what that what, of what it still means to have governmental institutions in society. Okay, we have time for one more here. Um, and this one is from Nathan Shapiro to Obedian. He says Obedian began with recourse to Paul and religious authorities. But is, is it not true that the Republic's fall and empire's um, rise simply a contest between religious extremists that corrupted the political system? In other words, was the empire's flaw a lack of separation of powers or a lack of separation between church and state? <laughs> Great question. Uh, and yes, to the point that uh, J- Jedi are uh, judicial activists, I would say they are theocratic judicial activists at that. Um, And, you know, I will uh, defend robustly uh, the right of individuals to bring their uh, religious values into the public square, uh, which is what I would say the emperor did in this case. Uh, His was a, I would say, a private, quiet faith, uh, but nonetheless, uh, something that deeply shaped who he was and how he approached public policy. And that's probably I would even be more robust uh, in my own uh, faith identity and connecting it to to my politics. I think the problem is when it, it becomes the Jedi, where you're essentially using your faith as a justification for your power. I, I will just go on record as saying that this is the very first time, and I will remember it for the rest of my life, of someone referring to a commitment to the dark side as a quiet, private faith. <laughs> <laughs> You are, you are truly Master Sir. <laughs> well, we have a really complicated test to see if that's an establishment clause violation. <laughs> so well, I, I think well, let me just say, Nathan, I find your lack of faith disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, um, I will hand this back over to our host. Thank you all. Thank you so much to all the speakers who joined us today. Thank you to um, <laughs> Ashley Baker, to Professor Mothoff, and to Dan Sir for joining us. On behalf of Scalia Law's chapter of the Federalist Society, I want to give a huge thank you to everyone who joined us today. And again, a big hand to our speakers. Uh, happy May the 4th, everyone. <laughs>